And with uh, instruction provided, I would like to once again welcome you all. My name is Malik Gooch, uh, Communications Coordinator for CCDC, Australian TP Tycoon family, story for another time. Today we are listening to the stories of parent advocates bring you into this world, but bring you out if you ever messed up. Uh, and as once again, I would like to re uh, reintroduce our panelists four lovely and great people I've gotten to work with, three of them I've gotten to work with, and one I just happen to know of. And I would like to begin with Dr. Irene. Thank you, Malik. Uh, my name is Irene Aguilar. I um, worked for Denver Health as a primary care doctor for 22 years, and I had the honor of being a state senator for eight years. I have three lovely children, ages 31 and 29 and 29, and uh, my advocacy for one of them brings me to this panel today. Thank you. And thank you for being here with us. Next will be Ms. Keisha. Hi, I am Keisha O'Neill and I am the parent of um, three very wonderful children and I am happy to be here. And then we have a Mr. Sean. Uh, Sean Davis, pronouns he, him. Um, I, uh, with PDF Consulting, I've been doing independent consulting and coaching the past 16 years. I'm also the father of four sons, age 29, 28, 27, a 14-year-old son with autism. And that's the reason I'm here on behalf of my 14-year-old son, who's my heart. And last but not least, Miss Danielle. Awesome. Good evening. My name is Danielle House. I am a mother of three. Um, my children, all three of them are gifted, but my youngest son is the only child with um, who is on the spectrum. He is also um, twice exceptional. So um, we're dealing with that. Um, and I got into this because I enjoy working and learning and want to learn how to help my son more so thank you for the opportunity okay and with that i would like to start on our questions with our panelists and a very our very first question is probably the most fundamental and basic definitely leads into the rest of this talk would you all mind sharing your journey into disability disability advocacy as a parent of a child living with a disability or multiple disabilities could you highlight any pivotal moments that sparked your advocacy efforts or a moment that defined your journey as an advocate? And for this question, we would like to start with Miss Irene. Thank you, Maylee. Um, so I was thinking about this and, um, and it was interesting because like many people of my era, I'm about 64 years old now, when I went to school, there weren't many children with disabilities at the school at all. I mean, I can't recall any. Um, or in the classroom. And so I think as a parent, I had no idea what, what my daughter's future might look like. And one of the first resources I was connected with was a um, effort called Parents Encouraging Parents that was funded by the Colorado Department of Education. And they took parents on um, a weekend away where um, you basically learned about the rights of people with disabilities. And you also um, have the opportunity to talk with other parents who've had that journey and, um, and learn from their experience. And I quickly learned that the experts in helping me with my family and our daughter with special needs were going to be other parents and definitely not the medical community who seemed pretty stymied by all the issues I rose, that arose. Um, and before going to Parents Encouraging Parents, my daughter was only 18 months old. I had planned to send her brother and sister to um, a preschool, and I had no idea what I would do with my daughter, Amy, and whether she would just need to stay home. And just by having that shared experience with her other parents, it became apparent that everything was possible for her. And I went out and the um, director of the preschool my kids were going to attend. Um, and she introduced me to the classroom teacher and they were completely 
accepting and willing to um, have Amy in the school and in the classroom. And I think it was an important lesson to learn that um, you have to start by asking, uh, by figuring out what it is you'd really like to see happen and then um, and go out and ask. And so at that young age, um, I was uh, enlightened very early about the potential for things to happen if I would only dream and try and make them happen. Thank you, Irene. Uh, now, Keisha? Um, I can actually say that um, kind of like Irene, um, my view was not um, the best growing up um, until I hit high school. And um, I was a peer counselor for the high school and we would actually help people with um, special needs because they didn't always um, have the children in the other classes in mainstream classes as um, they do now, which is very wonderful. Um, so I kind of had a feeling of, oh, this is something new and it's something great that we definitely need to put on many people's radar. Um, and the experiences that I had once um, my first child was born um, kind of made me look back on that and I felt worried for her because of those experiences that I had and just worried that she would face so many problems and adversity. And that just was something I did not want to happen and have her life be with that kind of stigma that they put on um, our children. And um there is a time that we went to um, the Shrine Hospital in um, Utah, and there they um, specialized in amputee um, clinic and assistance and surgeries and this kind of thing. And at that point was the pivotal moment for me because being there in the clinic with so many children that were just beautiful children and had so many obstacles that they've overcome. And um, just seeing that, it made me so excited to get involved and make sure that she was able to continue on and be wow. seen as, as she should be rather than as um, with those adversities that she needed to face or she was going to face. Thank you for that, Keisha. Now, Sean. Yeah, uh, my journey is a little different uh, in the sense that with autism, I spent the first, my son was diagnosed at two. Uh, for the first four years, I spent that time trying to fix him, trying to get him to become normal. Um, and really, you know, it was at that point when he turned six um, and interacted with uh, or seven with his elementary school teacher and doing some other research that one of the things, the conclusions I came to is, well, you know, he's not the real problem, you're the problem. And so on this journey, I really had to change how I view him, how I view disability not viewing it from a deficit perspective, but say, you know what, we spend so much time focusing on what they don't have. I spend a lot of time learning about his gifts, learning about all of the beauty that he bring into the world. And so in with my advocacy, I usually try to work on parents uh, and even people with disabilities to say, love yourself and really focusing on all the strengths you bring. You don't have to be the same as everybody else, and you don't have to do things the way everybody else do. We have to design the world uh, around you and don't always think you need to acclimate uh, to the world. And so in the work I do, it's really making sure, you know, people with disabilities have a voice, but that we bring them to the table so we're not speaking for them. So it's been 
an amazing journey um, to learn. And I tell people, you know, he's been one of my biggest teachers, viewing him from the heart. And so not viewing him by what he can do, what he can't do. Uh, but that that has been really an amazing journey to say everybody who I see, the objective should be to connect with them and not focus on what you see or don't see or how we think they should show up in the world. And so going from one who was very judgmental to one who really seeks to understand now, I spent a lot more time trying to understand. And so he brought that out of me. He's still nonverbal. Uh, he still communicates uh, with an iPad. Uh, he's uh, severely disabled, but most people, um, even a lot of people on this call who've met him will say he's one of the most nicest, most incredible humans that you'll meet. And so on this journey, I've really got to know him as a purpose, you know, as a person, removing that focus on the autism and how that shows up with the stemming and some of the other things. And so I think it's allowed me to be a better human and approach people as people, not what their race is, their sexual orientation, what their disability is, but who is the person underneath that? So I encourage everybody to look underneath and dig deeper than birth, than a lot of these surface things we tend to focus on. So that's been uh, my journey and it's really defined me as an advocate, because I think it helps us to see everybody in a positive light and everybody has a wonderful underside if we seek to explore it and look for it. Thank you, Sean. And now, last but not least, Dania. So um, my journey started, um, I guess, when I was young, because when I was young, um, my dad, he married um, a lady and her family members had um, some disabilities in, in their family. My stepbrother had a bone disease and he had his um, leg amputated off when he was seven. So I grew up around him and um, my his cousin, who had been my first cousin, um, she was born with um, the, um, one finger and so um, I was like her math tutor. She was one year younger than me. And even though she had a disability, none of, none of the family members growing her up around her ever treated her any differently. And so she was always able to do what everybody else did and nothing stopped her. So for me seeing that at a young age, it made me see like, well, I don't know what these people are crying around about who have all their limbs like they I know people who have less limbs than them and they're not complaining about life you know so it just brought in my perspective from a young age and then when I eventually had children my youngest daughter or my youngest daughter who is my my um, middle child she um she was perfectly fine in Head Start but then going into uh RE1 district which is the um the school district in Cortez, um, it was like a culture shock. I don't know, um, going from a native school to going to a uh, full white district school. And so um, the teachers just, and the classrooms were like, where she came from were like eight. And then she went to a classroom of like 25, 28 kids. Mm -hmm. And so like for my daughter, she just didn't get the one-on-one -on -one attention. I felt like she had gotten when she was in Head Start. And so she started to act out. Mm -hmm. And it got so bad to where she was running out of the school and just, I mean, it was really terrible. They called social services on me because my daughter ran out and wanted to run out in the street, she said, wow. and wanted to like get hit by a car. And like, you know, she told the school that and they were like, whoa, you know, and, and it was just kind of like, for me wanting to tell them like, I understand how you guys take it seriously, but coming from like the reservation where we live, like kids will just say stuff just to like say stuff to like get a rise out of somebody and not necessarily meaning they're going to do it, but they're just saying they're going to do it. And so, but anyways, it, it was just like, I think a phase and a way of getting attention kind of thing, but eventually we figured out she had ADHD and we ended up getting her on medication and took you know, some time before eventually got taken care of. But 
through all that, I learned what a 504 was and an IEP and all these things that go along with having a child that has different needs at school. And so I learned that when she was in kindergarten. And then at that same time, I'd gotten pregnant with my son and didn't know that he was on the spectrum until he was three years old. We took him to Head Start and he um, just didn't show signs like all the other kids, which I guess was just didn't seem like he was projecting a different side to other people than he was at home. And so I felt like, you know, my journey started with them advocating for them and, you know, being their voice because a lot of times they don't have the courage or they don't have the strength to um, say what their real needs are. And um, I like what Sean said, because a lot of times, you know, you learn from you know, other parents, because I've gotten so much information and help from other parents on my journey. And so I'm always open and honest when I hear somebody like, you know, in need, or if I see their kid kind of acting up in the in the grocery store, I'm one of those parents that go up to them and be like, you know what, I was there, it's okay, you know what, it's going to be all right, tomorrow's a new day, you know, so thank you for that time. Thank you, Danielle. Now we lead into our second question. As an advocate for your child or young adult living with a disability or multiple disabilities, how have you specifically provided support and acted as a resource within your own community? And once again, we will start with Irene. Thank you. Um, so it, because of what I learned about um, people with disabilities and their rights, um, as a physician, I started asking my patients um, if they had anyone in their family who had disabilities or any children with disabilities and referring them um, to resources and to other and to parent sources to help them deal with that. I was surprised at um, how many people didn't even know that there were things out there that they could use that would help support them in their daily lives. And then um, I went on to um, volunteer and become a member of the Colorado Developmental Disabilities Council, um, where I learned more about um, federal and state laws uh, related to people with disabilities. And we actually advocated, um, this is back in about 2000, with my state representative to ensure that boards uh, in the state that made decisions related to people with disabilities had representatives either of the disability community or of parents of children with disabilities. Um, and that eventually led to me becoming a state legislator and, um, and helping work on issues for Colorado Cross Disability Coalition and others at the state level. Um, but I always like to tell people that even with all of my experiences and everything I know, I still have to reach out and advocate myself for things for my daughter, even now. Um, I have to get someone to help me fill out that ridiculous Medicaid form because I always forget what I need to put down for her and things. And so I guess I wanna say I've learned a lot. I love helping other people get the help that they need, but, um, but the system unfortunately is still so complex that even with everything that I've learned and done, I still need help myself. Great, thank you. And would you like to add your input to that, Keisha? Um, I have a little bit different of a, of a community of perspective because we are a military family and um, starting, oh gosh, in the 90s, um, we moved around a lot, of course, with the military in different states. So it was a little difficult because I always felt like I was starting over with the advocacy. The um, We were um, in the Army and um, they have what is called the Exceptional Family Member Program, which um, looks at the needs of the children or the child that has been identified with special needs. And they will make sure that we're not um, 
sent to a base or a post or something like that that is not able to provide the services for their specific needs. And um, there actually has been um, a couple of times that we were sent to um, areas that did not have the resources that they needed. And we had to go out into the community um, to see civilian providers and civilian therapies and things like that. And um, I became an advocate for um, parents after I was feeling that I needed help. Just like Sean said, that there were things that I needed to learn. I needed to learn how there were additional ways that I could encourage and help my children along with the needs that um, they had. And it was with that, um, we started using networks and resources. And each time that we would um, PCS to a new duty station, I would keep in contact with others and um, continue to help them with speaking up for themselves and um, getting those outside resources outside of the military to um, facilitate facilitate the help they needed for their children. Thank you for that, Keisha. That's a great perspective to share, especially when you are as mobile as a military family would be. And would you like to add to that, Sean? Yeah, my, uh, you know, the advocacy work I do, um, just for full transparency, I'm going to be 100% honest and tell everybody, I do a lot of advocacy work in disability. The one area that for the most part I refuse to um, work in is autism. I had a really bad experience. Um, the first two times I got to talking to uh, groups of um parents and also people with autism, I cried through the whole session. And so they told me I absolutely made a horrible advocate because I couldn't communicate, I couldn't focus. And so one of the things I learned is that it is much too personal um, you know, to me. And so the way I do it is by working with uh, other disabilities. And so I oversee uh, health equity and work with Rocky Mountain Health Plans on the Western Slope. And so you know, one of my close friends is in a wheelchair and leads a disability rights organization. So I have the luxury of being mentored by her uh, and learning, uh, you know, first and foremost, as she told me, when we do this work, we got to make sure we involve the community. She said, because we got a model around here. She said nothing about us without. So she said, you know, you're not the spokesperson for the group. We have to bring the community to the table and so what that means is throughout the work, I get to, you know, work with the Native American community, the Spanish speaking community, um, the rural population, people with disabilities, the LGBTQ plus uh, population. And so it really has broadened my, you know, broadened my horizons uh, and allow, allowed me to not only be a better advocate, but learn from some amazing advocates in those populations. So I tell people, I tend to be unique and I get to work with a lot of voices um, that's different from mine. And I've got to learn from some of the best advocates uh, in the state of Colorado. So I was fortunate uh, to be trained right and really put the focus on the community and saying, you know what, this the work we're doing is really about them. So our job isn't to speak up, but really to make sure that they have a seat at the table. So if we're doing our work correctly, then that means we're bringing them to the table, not just speaking for them. So that's, you know, one of the biggest lessons I learned in being an advocate. It's not how loud my voice is, but whether or not I have the ability to bring the community to the table. So I think I've been very effective at convincing people to show up with us and join us in this fight to speaking up. But the biggest area we work in is healthcare, where we face a lot of challenges, both behavioral and physical health. So I've just been fortunate to be a part of the solution. And so it's been an amazing journey. And so I love the work. Thank you, Sean. 
And finally, Danielle. Okay, so um, I'd like to just add that um, as for me being a Native American um, living here on the reservation, I feel like um, being autistic or being on the spectrum wasn't really a thing like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. And so kind of like we're at the forefront of it and I feel like joining CCDC has been an excellent part of my journey as becoming an advocate for my son because I'm learning um, what is available out there and what can we bring to the reservation and help more of the kids um, here in the community because my son's not the only one. There, there are many kids here and they're all in need of help. And so um, I'm just grateful to be a part of the journey and bringing awareness and um, services to the um, reservation. Thank you, Danielle. And with that answer, we lead into now, I would like you all to just reflect on your role as an advocate and how has it been shaped by having to advocate for yourself, your children, child, and others with disabilities in essential areas, like Keisha said when she was moving across states as part of the military, but even the people here in Colorado, Colorado is a big place. So you you have you kind of have to build a community. But in terms of that, how do you advocate for all of these groups through means such as essentials for people like transportation, education, healthcare, employment, and so forth? And we would like to start with Irene. Um so um I had decided early on that I wanted my daughter to have a um, fully inclusive education. And I, I haven't um, named her labels yet, but she has um, physical and developmental disabilities. She um, has spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy. She's developmentally delayed. She's cortically visually blind and she has well-controlled seizures. And so, um, you know, on the rating scale, she's always off the top of the scales in terms of severity of disability. But, um, but despite that, she's a very happy young woman. And I, um, I thought that what was most important for her for her future life was to be socialized and meet people. Because um, I, um, unfortunately, it, her intellectual ability is such that she won't be able to read or write or have a job, but she um, can bring joy to other people in the community. And so I spent, um, a lot of time with my husband early on. Um, my husband is a doctor as well. And we literally would go to these private schools that were Montessori and ask if we could bring our daughter to their school for K through 12 um, and basically say, we're willing to pay for whatever services she needs. And um, allegedly the theory of Montessori is that all children can learn and all children are important. And we'd be turned away uh, right and left. And um, and it became apparent to me that we were going to have to just find a public school that would accept her. And luckily, I met a wonderful um, woman who is in charge of special education at Jefferson County Open School, which happens to be a K through 12 school. And so Amy went to Jefferson County Open School. They have a very alternative way of learning where you have personal mm -hmm. growth and educational growth and other things. And so um, it ended up being a great fit for her. We live in Denver County and somehow her services are being paid for by Denver County to Jefferson County. And all of a sudden Denver County, I think had a financial um, crisis. And so they sent me a letter in the mail saying, you have to put your daughter into the local Denver County school. Um, but at that point, I knew all the laws and all the rules. Um, and I knew that that when it's a big fight like that, you should get help. So I reached out to Advocacy Denver, and they connected me with their attorney. Her IEP had always said that she needed an inclusive education. And, um, and so that was sort of one of my formal fights for my daughter um, using the rights that she has 
as a person living in the United States with disabilities and we were able to get her um, approval to complete her education at Jefferson County Open School through age 18. Um, and one of the things that was so wonderful about that, she was in about eighth grade at the time when DPS wanted to try and pull her out, is that the children at the school were writing letters in support of her staying at the school and talking about the impact she had had on their lives and on them knowing how to um, w work with people who were different and, um, and that they had found um, they had love for her even though her abilities are quite different. So it was great to see the community step up to help but um, but also just a reminder that unfortunately the laws are needed to help you with your child and you need to be aware. And if something doesn't seem right, you need to ask somebody who really knows the law and make sure you're getting what you want for your child. Thank you, Irene. That's a very beautiful tale and probably a very important one to have showing a community coming together to help. Uh, with that, can we, or would you like to share any, Keisha? I would say that I advocated for myself because of that support that I had mentioned before of um, learning and making it feel like it wasn't something that I did to cause um, anything in my children as far as what, um, disabilities that they have. And, um, like Irene, I have not, um, shared, but, um, one of, um, my children, um, have multiple disabilities, both medical and physical. And, um, the one that is physical, of course, is the, the prevalent one. Um, and, I spent a lot of time advocating for her through education. The medical side of it came more easily to advocate and to make sure that she was getting what she needed because, like I said, that program through the military was um, pretty helpful. And um, just like my daughter, I am a strong person when it comes to something that I believe in and um, very vocal about that. So um, getting that help in that aspect was was easier than the social as aspect and with um, education. And um, she's done very well with her employment um, endeavors. And my son as well has um, done well and his um, disabilities are not seen um, just like hers have been. And when she was in elementary school before she could advocate and really oh, speak up for herself, um, there were times or when we would start a new school year, I would get with the teacher that she was gonna be in that class with and we would come up with a plan that how we would get the other children to accept her um, more easily. And we would start the classroom or start the year off. This is um, my daughter. This is what um, is, you know, showing with her. And it's not something that you can catch. It's not something that is going to hurt you or anything like that. And we would play a game of um, ring around the rosy and the children would hold her hand. And that is what um, her disability, the, the physical one is, is she's missing fingers on her left hand. And I endearingly call it her heart hand. Um, but um, the children would then hold hands and that kind of thing. And it seemed to help with that because the children would not be afraid of her and be more accepting. Thank you, Keisha. Honestly, uh, hearing tales of having to have different experiences based on visible 
disabilities versus invisible disabilities is a great story to share. And especially when you experience it with two of your children. And that's a very great thing to bring it to attention to. And now Danielle, if you wouldn't mind sharing. So <clears throat> where I really advocate um, for my children is in the education as well. And it's because um, I feel like that's um, where, um, that's where they spend the most time at besides my home. And I feel like, um, I feel like I want them to understand my child like I understand my child. And things will go a lot easier for them if they, follow my lead and go with the flow like how I tell them you know a lot of times my oldest daughter she thinks that I um kind of like baby baby my son because you know I um I try to avert crisis is what I do so you know it's not that I'm trying to like baby him or any coddle him or anything but I do try to like kind of shelter him in a way because I don't want him to have to go through so much all the time and because it is a lot for him every single day and you know there are days when there are good days and there are days when there are bad days and a lot of times when it comes to education it really depends on the teacher because I've noticed with my son from the time when he started school if he did not have the connection with the teacher then it was going to be a hard year for everybody and um you know, it really matters when he has that um, connection and they understand his needs. And so it's my job, I feel like, to um, to voice those for him now until he can verbally voice them for himself. Thank you, Danielle. And now we get to the last question, and I'm going to preface this. There is an obvious answer. I want you all to elaborate further on this question. <laughs> I know it has a very obvious example, but where do you find the motivation and resilience to continue your advocacy work as a parent of a child or young adult living with a disability or multiple disabilities? Like I said, there's a very obvious answer. Everyone answers that whenever they have to talk about advocacy. So, oh, uh, actually I'm just, Realizing, Sean, I actually okay. did not ask you the last question. <laughs> I am very sorry. Would you like to no, go? Yeah, that's okay. You know, I first of all, I tell people for me, um, I don't view being advocate as a role. I view it as being part of my uh, parental duties. Um, once I found out um, I had a son with a disability, with autism, the journey, you know, the task became how do you make sure you have all the tools you need to provide for his needs? And so at that point, I took it upon myself to say, this is your responsibility. And everybody you come into contact with, um, you have to be able to know that. And so it took a lot of learning on my part. I tend to focus on healthcare um, professionally. And I usually tell people just you know, by way of education, I have a, you know, a master's in gerontology. And so I studied this stuff for literally like 15 years. But until I became a parent, I didn't have an ideal what life was like uh, for people with disabilities. And so in my work, part of what I try to help people understand is professionals, a lot of us who are professionals are well-meaning, but sometimes if you haven't walked that certain road, you really don't have an idea of what that family uh, or individual is going through. And so for me, I always start with empathy, uh, start with understanding, um, because a lot of times the knowledge or education leads you down a certain road, whereas understanding a person's background, their story, what they're going through, and really letting them tell you what they need. Um, and so I tend to operate in the healthcare space and we, you know, we partner and work with systems that allow our voice to be heard. And so it's really getting members to speak up, uh, getting them to tell doctors and physicians what they need us speaking to in the Medicaid space, um, the Ray and leadership really listening to us. So I, I feel blessed. I tell people it was something that without it, it wouldn't have forced me to be a better human. So every day I wake up and say, how can I be better? And so 
I always start with self. And then I think by doing that, it rubs off on other people and, and all of the groups that I work with. Thank you, Sean. So, sorry again, I skipped you. I no, got a little excited. No, it wasn't intentional. I know where you live, so I could always come look for you. <laughs> work partner, people. Work associates. <laughs> Loud them. Anyway, as I said last time, where do you find the motivation and resilience to continue your advocacy work as a parent of a child or young adult living with a disability or multiple disabilities? And as I mentioned before, if you you can answer your kid if you want, but if, I would also like it if you guys could uh, further elaborate a little bit. And I would like to start with Irene. Thank you. Um, you know, I was looking at this question and thinking about how... Um, and I don't know where the rest of you grew up, but I grew up in inner city Chicago and my um, older sisters um, had um, a rocky path through elementary and high school. And so my parents moved us to a predominantly white community um, where I was literally, you know, one of two Latinas in grade school and I, um, and it was frequently pointed out to me, there were no people who were black in my grade school at all. If you know about Chicago and Mayor Daly was the mayor of the city, is historically been very segregated. And so um, I, I underestimated how much that taught me about being a self-advocate um, until my child was born. Um, and, um, and a funny, not funny story is that my husband who happens to be white was very overwhelmed by having a child who was different. <laughs> and me having been different my whole life, it was like, well, she's just different in a different way than I'm different. Yeah. Um, we're both different. Mm -hmm. um, and interestingly, at, at some points in her life, I felt like, um, like having a disability um, is just such a huge, um, obstacle to deal with um and in some ways it was easier to be brown in a white neighborhood i was amazed at the level of discrimination that that i felt that my daughter experienced i mentioned the montessori schools um trying to register her for other events um where you felt like you know do i tell them she has a disability or will they just mm -hmm. write her off immediately um, and so I think some of um, where I get my resilience is from my own life experience and having worked as an advocate really for myself as a Latina growing up in white communities and, and sadly, even as a, a physician and part of a, you know, top 5% in the country, there are many people of color in that group. And I frequently find myself in locations where I'm the only person of color and it, um, it now because of my daughter, I'm also looking for other people there with disabilities. Um, and, um, and am I overlooking uh, hurdles that they're facing that I was also facing? So of course, number one is just the love for my child and my desire for her to have people who love her in her life and to be safe. Um, she is very, very vulnerable. Um, Although she actually has a pretty mean pinch on her and has somehow learned to pinch you <laughs> on the boob if she's really mad. Um, and people will be like, oh my God, she did this. I'm like, oh good. So if somebody tries to do something to her, she can defend herself. Um, so some of it is, is that my love for her. Um, but some of it is what I've learned in my own life growing up. Thank you for that, Irene. Hopefully I never end up having to be pinched by your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try my, I'll mind my manners. And now can we lead into Keisha? I would have to say that my motivation um, for advocating for my children is definitely their happiness. Um, knowing what and how cruel the world can be and being differently abled or having those silent disabilities as I've always called them because it, it like 
it can happen to anybody and you never know what people are living with and dealing with. And so with their happiness, it brings me that motivation. And I would definitely say um, the resilience has come from um, advocating for so long for them and continually wanting them to be the best that they can be with as many opportunities that they can have. And I always tell them that even though I had a life before I gave birth, it feels like my life began and had purpose once my babies were here. And that love is um, always going to be a motivation as well. And that's all I'm going to say for right now. Well, I am confident your children appreciate your efforts a lot, uh, Keisha. And for that, I do want to quickly uh, open up the space for the chat to write in any questions as we will be going into a Q&A section after we hear from our last two panelists on this question. So if you guys would like to start sharing your opinions and, you know, there's stuff we can't cover as like, quote unquote, officials for this event. So if you guys have any highly specific questions, please feel free to answer them about the world of advocacy from the uh, lens of a parent. And with that, Sean, you have the floor. Yeah, mine, I'm internally motivated. Um, and what I be, mean by that is, like I said, my goal is to be a better human and be a better father, to be a better husband, but really to be better every single day and really to put myself in places where I can evaluate that and actually show up. And I think in the disability space, really showing up. And I take my son to a lot of places that normally it's the first, you know, I've, I've, I've taken him to both of the tribes. And so it's the first time, you know, a lot of spaces that they've seen a person with autism. And so, uh, you know, one of the things they said down there, they said, you know, you're not, um, you know, ashamed to be around them. And so my policy, if my son isn't welcome, I'm not welcome anywhere. So we come as a package. And so I tell everybody, I'm, you know, proud. He's different. I'm different. Uh, and, uh, I could really relate to what Irene was saying, you know, growing up black, you face so many adversity, you know, res you know, resilience becomes the norm. And so for me, I had to unlearn some of that because uh, some of the I'm so used to going in the back door. I don't even, you know, check to see if the front door is open. So sometimes I just head around the back and they say, what are you doing? And I'll be like, oh, and they'll be like, yeah, the, you, you go in the front. So I have a tendency to always have a plan A and plan B uh, for anything. And I'm always uh, prepared. Uh, like you say, I'm self-employed. So I tell people, you know, my contracts aren't guaranteed. So I'm always prepared for the worst. And luckily it hasn't happened. Uh, but really that resilience, you know, growing up and now it's like, I can instill this in the next generation and say, one, you got to have self-love, uh, you know, self-empowerment. And it starts with self. We want the systems to be changed and all the external but a lot of the change we got to do ourselves and we got to show up and be better people. So that's always, I try to model the way being a better person and letting other people hold me accountable. And then after that, we can um, fight and as they say, raise hell at the systems level. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Danielle, are you ready to share? Sure. So, um... My motivation, um, I guess I'm going to kind of touch base on what everybody kind of already said. So, um, you know, growing up um, different because I was half Native and half white. So growing up in Pennsylvania around all white kids, I was different, even though I don't look Native as everybody else, you know, but compared to them, I was different. And so I grew up being bullied and treated differently. And I guess when I was younger, I would have, if I would have known that my uniqueness would have been like my, my superpower, then I would have just been like walking like a rock star back then. But, you know, that didn't come till later. But my motivation really comes also from their happiness, you know, seeing them succeed and, you know, 
the little the little victories you know that they have you know makes it worth it you know the tears that we share shed and you know like it all is worth it when there's that little victory that they have or you know when there's things that you think they're oh my god this is gonna this is gonna set him off and then all of a sudden he just handles it like a champion you know and i'm like what was i so worried about you know like this kid's got it you know so when those moments happen it really it really makes me feel like um I'm doing my job and and I want to kind of reiterate what Sean said as being like a good person you know and being that good role model for them and you know letting them know that it's okay to speak up if things aren't you know what you think they should be it's okay it's not bad and so um, sometimes it's good to speak up because um, people don't know that they're doing something that's not right unless you let them know in an appropriate way of course so Thank you, Danielle. And with that, the official questions are all off the table. They have all been answered. All of our check marks have been met. <laughs> and we actually have one question already asked by Megan Lovelace. What is your advice for parents who are not able to achieve success with their child's school, even after you file an OCR complaint? If uh, we will open this up to the floor overall, if you want to take the first step, but we would prefer if we could hear from all of you on this subject. I would say uh, fight, you know, um, I think whenever you're working with the school systems uh, constantly, um, I'm biased. My, my first response is always engage. Uh, if you can CCDC, uh, they have some amazing advocates but really go to the school principal. Uh, and you're right, some of, I, I think we face some amazing challenges that I don't think in certain situations like Megan is describing, simple advice uh, might do because some of these are amazingly complex systems, but I would say uh, never give up and continue to fight. And so whether or not you, you're making progress by just being at the table fighting. And so, you know, my message is just always remember who's on the other end and that's your child. So I would say whatever you do, even if the outcome isn't the way you want it, every day show up and be able to stand up and fight for your child because at the end of the day, you 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 only can control what you put forward. You're, you're not gonna necessarily control the school district's decision or anything like that. So I'm a huge fan of go all out and continue to fight irregardless of the out. So that's just, uh, and I don't know if that necessarily, you know, addressed it directly, but just continue to fight and continue to show up. Mm -hmm. I agree. And um, I would say the same thing. And if, uh, if you've reached out to the principal, I've even gone to the superintendent of the district who is the head of everything. And I've voiced my opinions and, you know, he's given me options and what I should do. And a lot of times I have to swallow some pride and, you know, but it's for my child's better education, then I'm going to sometimes swallow something. But, you know, I think that um, we need to um, be very vocal when we're in the IEP meetings that what, what kind of accommodations and what we need for our kid and, um, be very vocal at, at that time, as well as in the beginning of the year, because um, it's always a new school year, new teachers always be, um, for me, I always try to make contact with my son's teachers before the school year starts. I try to find out who it is. And so we can get um, that face to face. Um, so it will go a lot smoother. Um, I'm going to be taking a lot of what Sean taught me um, with next year, getting him in with a good group of friends and, um, He's starting to realize now there are good friends and there are bad friends. And so um, he's, I'm going to start trying to push him more towards the good friends. And so hopefully he'll have good, um, good, um, what do you, can't think of the word, um, but um, he'll have good positive um, reinforcement with his friends around him. And so um, I think that's all I have for that. Um, I I agree with um, both Sean and Danielle. I your child has a right 
to a free appropriate public education. And if you're not getting there um, on your own, then get help for people to help you. I live in Denver and Advocacy Denver um, does have a staff person who focuses on special education, um, but I don't know what the other um, groups are around there. I'm sure CCDC could help you there who I get to help me with adult issues for my daughter. Um, and, and I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't rule out the possibility that you might want to choose to move to a different school um, because uh, you're not happy with how they're dealing with things and the culture that exists in that school. Um, and that's a huge hassle for you as a parent, but I do think um, that it is something that um, that is also on the table because at the end of the day, you want your child to get the best education they can. And if the school is fighting everything, um, it's not gonna benefit your child, but definitely get advocates to help you. I think um, Disability Law Colorado also does advocacy for um, school and education issues. As I mentioned before, um, I'm passionate about things that I truly believe in. And sometimes that makes me be a in your face kind of person. Mm -hmm. And so I would actually uh, volunteer in the classes if you are able to. And also if any of the kids would tell me that they were facing things, problems again and again, then I would actually go into the class and just be there. Um, sometimes I would go in as an observer and see what issues were happening. And I would go up the chain of command to have the issues addressed. Okay. And with that, we have our second question, and this is the final question, so make it count, all of y'all. <laughs> what can schools do to better support parents of children with disabilities? Again, the floor is open to anyone who wants to start. So my my change, Malik, I think, you know, I will first of all say that the most impactful person who we learned the most from who really changed my son's life was a second grade teacher. Um Funny as it was, she knew absolutely nothing about autism. She called us in, into her office at the beginning of the school year, and she said, Mr. and Ms. Davis, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know about autism, but I want to get to know Sean as a human, uh, just as a person. What does he like? What does he like to do? And so she spent the whole school year really learning about him as a person, not just as a kid with autism, but what does he like? Um, you know, he communicates through a talker. So she would pass the talker around so all the kids could understand what it was like to actually communicate with a talker. Uh, each day she would let a different kid go out in the hallway and really um, just say communicate with him. At the beginning of the school that school year, uh, his social skills on a scale of one to 10 was in between a negative one and a zero. He would just go in the corner, he wouldn't speak. Um, by by the end of the year, he was around a seven or eight. And I can tell you, we've worked with ABA therapists. We've worked with speech therapists. None of them had made the, you know, the progress that a teacher who cared did. And she really brought it, his personality out and really allowed it to shine. So my biggest message is teachers and people who care a lot of times we think it has to be expertise, but I think a caring, just like a caring mentor, a caring person in their life, in our kids' life, but especially the teachers makes all the difference in the world and make sure they're in a supportive environment. Uh, Cause I have, you know, really seen some negative instances at school, but then luckily I'm in a, you know, a different situation where the whole school has adopted kindness mm -hmm. as one of the school's 
uh, values. And so, uh, you know, I feel very blessed that the school has tried to learn about autism and really values people who are different, especially, you know, kids with disabilities. That's a great story, Sean. It kind of reminds me of my own teacher. Uh, for reference, I have uh, hearing difficulties. And I just remember having one teacher who was always like, yeah, he doesn't really ask questions or anything. And like this teacher was famous for speaking like in a low tone, very, very soft. And then when like a parent teacher conference would come around, my mom's like, oh, yeah, he has hearing difficulties. He went, oh, OK, so I need to shout like he was always confused. He's like, he does his work perfectly fine. He understands it, but like he never asks questions or anything. Oh, he can't hear or he can't. He's having difficulties hearing me. But yeah, yeah so let's open up the floor again. So was the question about how a school can help support parents of children with disabilities? Yes, yes it okay. was. Um, so um, I think that a lot of schools are very under-resourced um, and I don't know that they have the resources to help support that. Um, if you're an activist parent and you wanna try and start a group a support group for parents of kids with disabilities, um, that would be cool. But if not, there are groups like Parents Encouraging Parents. Um, well, that's uh, a training program, but through that you meet other parents of kids with disabilities. I find that um, talking with other parents has always been sort of the most impactful, informative method of learning for me. Um, and then there are, um, now that my daughter is older and I've met other people, I, I don't participate as much, but there are parent support groups that exist online, including um, one in Spanish, El Grupo Vida. Um, and they have meetings and educational sessions and stuff. And so I do think it's worthwhile finding parent support groups for assistance um, and for sharing knowledge and for sharing experiences. Um, and getting the support that you need. And if you're really feeling bold, go out and start one, a group yourself. And you could ask um, Sean to help you because he seems like a person who'd be great at that. <laughs> Thank you, Irene. <laughs> Sean's always down to help anybody. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need an intention getter, call up Sean. <laughs> Uh, Keisha or Danielle, any comments? On the subject of school, I'll play the role of the I'll teacher say, and pick. <laughs> I'll say um, that um, I agree. The teachers need to take more of a role um, when it comes to getting to know you know, an individual child. A lot of times um, it just takes a little bit more um to get to know the child in particular whoever you're trying to speak about um because every child's different of course and so um sometimes it just takes that you know getting down on their level and talking to them and making them feel like you care and of course they're going to feel safe enough to open up they're going to feel safe enough to talk they're going to feel safe enough to go to the teacher if they need something but you know when you have I've experienced bad teachers too, and it's a nightmare because they're constantly ridiculing your child and you're and you're thinking to yourself like, don't you see what's making him go crazy? Don't you see what's setting him off? Because, you know, they're, my son can take so much, but then, you know, when he, when he eventually snaps, yeah, he will go off and you know, it takes a lot to get into that point sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, just depending on the action, I just really feel like the schools need to take um, more time getting to know their students, both with disabilities and without, you know, because I have daughters that don't have disability, and she needs her teacher's attention just as much as my kids with, with disabilities, you know, so that's my input on that. I would definitely say that I agree with everyone on the panel that um, it is getting to know the children um, 
but also I would say that it's teamwork, that we have to stay, we can't at the beginning of the school year say, okay, this is my child, this is what their needs are, this is how we help them, this is what's worked in the past, anything like that, we need to make it consistent and we need to continually educate those that are around our children and continue that work instead of just letting it dissipate at a point. So just continuing to make that teamwork um, a priority for the entire school year. And that goes for any activity, whether it be playing basketball at the Y or anything like that. I do think that that teamwork situation is a need for our children. Okay. And since we do have a bit of extra time slated, I wanted to just ask a real quick extra question. Let's make it a quick response, like uh, preferably one paragraph if we were to write this out. Uh, and it is Nikki Martin asking, how do you best care for yourself to keep going? We all know how exhausting advocacy can be. It's a very exhausting field. So can we start with Irene and just everyone give maybe one to two sentences how they keep going? Um, so my husband is a great support to me and, um, and I can vent and say to him what I couldn't say in the meeting to the other people. And that's helpful to be able to get it out somewhere and have somebody say, oh, yeah, I would have wanted to say that, too. And then I do have um, a, a very close friend who is uh, also a mother of a child with special needs. Um, and it's just so nice to have a safe place because you always want your child, everybody to think the best of your child and and, you know, not see the the work that's being done behind the scenes. And so it's nice to have someone who you know is doing the same work we can just vent to and let like the real thing get out. Uh, and then um, we, um, we when my ch children were young um, and not everyone I know has this family support or the financial ability to do this, but we would intentionally do a date night um, once a month um, just to get out of the house and bond together um, because we knew that the stronger we were, the stronger we were for our fights. Okay, thank you, Irene. Bisha? Um, I have a small circle of friends that um, I am able to, like Irene, vent to and have that safe space to... Um, express myself. Um, I also had a wonderful mother um, that I have always been able to go to in need of anything, but my parents would um, help out a lot in the times that they saw me getting frustrated or exhausted with the care of the kids, especially with um, the medical side of, um, with things with my kids. And I also participated in therapy, um, actually seeing a therapist because of the different feelings I was having, um, the skills of that therapist to help give me insight and, um, coping skills or, um, just, things to help me make sure I was still okay and strong so that I could help them. I I know I already spoke, but thank you for saying that, Keisha. I saw a therapist too for a long time. And now and again, I'll still call up a therapist if like something is really driving me crazy or I, um, I feel like I've asked too much of my friends, which they always say I haven't, but you know, um, so yes, uh, very important to destigmatize getting counseling and therapy to help you um, just function better as a person. I I think um, it's a resource that's very much underused. All right, thank you, both of you. 
and also therapy does work. If, if you take anything away from tonight, therapy helps a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean, if you would like some input. Yeah, mine is, my, you know, my, my thinking is a little different. I think I tell people, um, I've had people say, um, you know, how do you, how does it feel to be black? And I tell people, you know, I was born this way. So I signed up for this. Once my son was diagnosed, this is something I signed up for. It was like, so I do have a wonderful family. Um, and then I have great coworkers. I'm fortunate to work with an amazing group of people. You know, there was somebody who wanted um, to put on a, a webinar for minorities highlighting voices of disabilities. Uh, and she said, I'm going to call it Unstoppable Together. And so as a result, we're all here. So, you know, I just I just have the opportunity to work with people who have vision, who are creative and really every day I wake up, they have great ideas. And so it forces me to, you know, step my game up. So I absolutely love to work and the people I work with energize me. So I feel, you know, blessed in that. Kind of yeah. You know, I also I'm also pretty appreciative to that lady who started it Unstoppable Together, too. Maybe someday yeah. we should sing her praises when we get the chance. Yeah, okay. yeah, she maybe, can come maybe off once camera. We can give her a little, uh, a little, a little congratulations. Maybe, maybe for the season finale. Maybe, maybe at at the end we have a whole dedication to it. Make it a big old event. Yeah. Somebody bring flyers. Somebody bring like noisemakers and everything. <laughs> All right, Danielle. Any comments? Um. So for me, I think. Um how I would, I guess, recharge my batteries or um, for me is, I know this is kind of weird, but like I have a second job and I'm a financial analyst. So I do statistical reports for the Mountain Casino. And so um, that is kind of like my zen. Like I get in there and I work on my reports and I do my statisticals and I get it all done. And at the end of the month, I'm like, I got it done and I, you know, it's complete it's in the file, you know, and it just makes me feel so good, you know, and it's quiet and it's, there's no, you know, it's just my little spot where I have, and a lot of people who come into my office, they're always like, this, this is a spot, man. This is like therapy right here. When you come in, you sit down, it's got that vibe, you know, it's just good. And so um, I think a lot of it, because I have a lot of plans, and that's my other thing that I, I like to do is that um, I'm just really into like growing things and trying different stuff and just seeing what grows here because I live in the desert. So what grows grows and what doesn't doesn't. So um, I'm just, I just find my peace that way, you know. And therapy, you're right. I do go to therapy as well. I am a strong believer in um, getting help when you need it. Thank you on that, Danielle. And with that, we are closing the Q&A section and are now heading into the closing. I want to thank everyone tonight for their active participation. And I only have one more request of the audience. We do run a survey at the end of each of these events to kind of tell us what we can do better You're on mute, Motley. You're on mute. We are moving out of the Q&A. Sorry. It, it, the people who can read lips understood what I meant or <laughs> under meant what I said. But if we, if we, uh, we are, one moment. The survey, do you want them to fill out the survey? Yes, I would like them to fill out that survey. I had linked it myself and we are just moving forward with that. But there is a very specific message I do want to give out today. And this is no longer me, Malik Gooch, the communications coordinator. This is me, Malik Gooch, the son of a very wonderful woman who has helped me grow as an individual myself. Uh, as I've said, I've worked professionally with Sean, I've worked professionally with Danielle, and I've worked professionally with Irene. And the one I only happen to know is Miss Keisha O'Neill, my mother. Mine and Sayana Don's mother. And with that, 
we, as she shares her experiences in hearing all of the love she gives to us, there is so much to be thankful for. And if I can get a little informal because she knows the way I speak, thank you, mama. Thank you and I love you. Thank you for so much. And I want to say that as well as a son, that we want to thank every parent for all you have ever done for us. If there is anyone who has ever had their, had our backs and have been in our corner since day one, it's probably y'all. And as the same, same case I said, y'all brought us into this world and we thank y'all for not taking us out. But <laughs> alongside that, now to put the ma uh, mask back on, communications coordinator Malik Gooch. <laughs> To our audience, thank you for spending the evening with us. If you would like to stay up to date about all things CCDC or to make a donation, please check out our website at ccdconline.org. Join us June 20th for our in-person Unstoppable Together community gathering, Liberation Through Unity, in which we will celebrate people of color and their allies thriving with disabilities at the Urban Sanctuary Yoga Studio in Five Points. You know, this is an event for y'all who always think to yourselves, man, I would like to meet some of these people in person. I know. I I kind of have that effect at times. <laughs> but and on that, please follow our Facebook or check out the website for more details coming forward. We will also be opening registration for that event very soon, within the next few days. And from me, CCDC, and I believe I can speak for our panelists, Mr. Sean Davis, Dr. Irene Aguilar, Ms. Danielle uh, House, and Ms. Keisha O'Neill. Thank you all for such a great evening and we hope the best. Thank you everybody. <laughs>